This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Now we're going to look at the functions of money and the functions of financial intermediaries. And this should be a relatively straightforward chapter. First of all, the uses or the functions of money. Uh, and it's a means of exchange. Uh, uh, it allows us to buy and sell. If you didn't have money as a means of exchange, the only way you could buy and sell and trade is by barter, the exchange of goods. Uh, but now I can sell something for $100. Uh, I can keep that $100 for a day, a week, a month. And then when I find something I want to buy, uh, I can, at a different time, in a different place, to a different person, I can spend the $100 and buy something from a supplier. If you didn't have that, you'd really have to negotiate kind of simultaneous swapping of goods or bartering of goods. Secondly, it's a store of value. Uh, the money itself is worth uh, an amount. You can spend it. Uh, and of course, you can store it in a bank, one of the uses of financial intermediaries. So it allows you to save. How could you save if you didn't have money? How could you save really by bartering? You could, of course, accumulate, I suppose, physical goods, uh, but then there's huge expense and difficulty uh, in keeping those in good condition and keeping it safe. It's a unit of account. It allows us to keep score. It allows us to uh, say, well, this is my income and here's how I'm going to be spending it. It allows you to plan and to budget. And it is a, a, a method of deferred payment. Uh, I, I buy goods, but I don't have to actually uh, uh, spend the money immediately. I could buy goods on 30 days credit, and at the end of 30 days, then I can pay the supplier for those goods. Uh, perhaps I'm waiting for me to sell the goods to get some money coming in, and, and, and so on. But it means that purchase and the flow of value doesn't have to be quite simultaneous. I would find it extremely difficult to function in any sensible way uh, without the concept of money. Of course, people used to, uh, but economies were small and simple. What about uh, financial uh, intermediaries? Uh, financial intermediaries, uh, here we have them in the, uh, the, 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 the center of this diagram uh, here. Uh, for example, banks. Uh, so we have businesses. Businesses will uh, receive money from individuals as they sell to individuals and the businesses can put that in the bank. Uh, uh, and the bank uh, or the business can then have it being paid out to another business and, and, and so on. Businesses will have exchanges with government. It could be that the uh, business has to pay the government tax uh, and the chances are that this is going to be coming through the financial intermediary uh, like that. Uh, businesses pay money into their bank account and then later on at some time they will pay this out to the government uh, as uh, uh, taxation. We have individuals and overseas, individuals trading with overseas or individuals simply uh, changing money uh, to go on holidays overseas and so on. Uh, and again, it, it, it's, it, it could happen directly, of course, uh, but the chances are it's going to go through a bank. We will pay some money into the bank. Uh, the bank will pay us some foreign currency out, and then we can take out on our holidays and we can pay overseas uh, restaurants, hotels, and so on uh, like that. Financial intermediaries, uh, like banks, uh, are extremely helpful in commerce. Uh, and here's some of the... Uh, uh, functions that banks acting as financial intermediaries carry out, very important functions. First of all, it is safe storage. Uh, we could, of course, uh, sell goods for cash, uh, but then we'd have to do something with that cash to keep it safe. We'd have to hide it or have our own uh, security arrangements at home, a, a wall safer or something of that type. Uh, now we can pay the money into the bank and it's uh, pretty safe. 
Of course, there are from time to time fraudulent activities which uh, occur, uh, but provided we haven't been careless in in releasing uh, PIN numbers and so on, we will generally be reimbursed by the bank. Secondly, there is risk reduction. Risk reduction, of course, comes from uh, 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 safe uh, storage, but risk reduction can come uh, when investing. Uh, what tends to happen is you put money in the bank, then the bank will lend that on to other customers. Uh, if it, that allows the bank to earn interest from those customers and then perhaps pass on some of that interest to you so that you can earn interest. The banks are, are extremely skilled uh, and have got whole legal departments uh, and credit control departments at assessing which customers are risk worthy, which it's safe to lend money to. If the customer defaults and doesn't pay interest or installments as they should be, banks have uh, legal departments which can try to uh, follow the debt up and so on. And banks, of course, can uh, uh, form very tight contracts when they're lending money. This would all be very difficult for individuals to do. It was certainly not a great efficiency, the great economies of scale in doing it individually. Maturity transformation. Typically, if I put money into a bank, uh, I probably want it back within a month. So my salary would come in uh, maybe at the beginning of the month. And then during the month, I would, you know, I would be using that uh, salary up to pay various uh, purchases. There might be a little bit left uh, that I can put aside at the end of the month as savings. So my uh, many depositors put money in the bank relatively short term, saving for a holiday, maybe saving for a car, saving for the tax that has to be paid maybe in six months' time. Uh, but many businesses want to borrow money in the long term. If you're buying a, a new machinery or putting up a new factory, you may require a loan of five years. Uh, and banks uh, manage this maturity transformation. They can take money in the short term from many depositors and they can lend it in the long term. Now that is in a way traditionally dangerous. Uh, it's called borrowing short and lending long. Uh, what happens if uh, all your depositors want the money back kind of immediately, yet you have a loan outstanding for a long time with the uh, uh, the borrower there? How are you going to pay that back? But it works with banks because uh, they're kind of assuming that not everyone will want to take money out at the same time. Uh, if they do, then you have what's called a run on the bank. And sometimes this happens if people get nervous about the uh, the, the safety of the bank, if they think it may be going to fail, you can sometimes see queues of people outside the bank all wanting their money out then and uh, that, that same day. And this can put the bank under considerable strain. And in fact, this is one of the uses of what are known as central banks, like the Bank of England. They're known as lenders in the last resort. Uh, and they will usually lend the bank money so that the bank can uh, give the money back to its depositors uh, should there be a run on the bank. Consolidation. Consolidation means uh, that individuals might be, say, typically putting a thousand dollars in the bank, uh, but uh, an, a, 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 a business might want to borrow a hundred thousand. So what the bank can do, it can have a hundred people depositing a thousand, and they can lend that on as one amount of a hundred thousand to uh, the businesses who require the money. Credit creation, we'll see an example of that towards the end of the lecture, uh, but what it means uh, really uh, is that banks can create money, can create credit uh, by lending to uh, people, lending on the deposits to people. Uh, but we'll see a numerical example of that uh, presently. Intermediation. Intermediation means getting between uh, uh, the lenders and the depositors. Anyway, how are you going to meet them? If I had some money, let's say I had $10,000 that I, I didn't need for a couple of years, and I say, right, I want to invest that, I want to lend that to somebody, how am I going to find people? Uh, what, what sort of kind of matchmaking is going to be going on uh, to finding people who want to borrow $10,000? Uh, there are 
a few growing now with the internet, what are called peer-to-peer -peer lenders, uh, who try to match up borrowers and lenders on the internet, but it's very low business. It tends to be done with banks. Everyone knows if I want to put money on deposit, I can go to a bank. Everybody knows if I want to try and borrow money from a business, I can go for a bank and see what they say. So, so there are uh, like matchmakers between uh, depositors and borrowers. And finally, of course, transfer of money. Uh, when my salary is paid, very few salaries uh, are nowadays, certainly in the UK, paid as cash. It is a transfer between the employer's bank account and the employee's bank account. Uh, it's much safer, it's much quicker, it's much cheaper to do because you don't have this uh, bulk transfer of cash and all the security problems that are surrounding that. It would be really very difficult indeed to do without banks. And I say that despite some of the excesses uh, that led us to the uh, financial crash around 2008. Other financial intermediaries, we have insurance companies uh, to uh, handle some of the risk. They insure your car, they will insure your home, they will insure your business uh, in, in case you damage a customer in some way. Investment trusts and unit trusts are very similar. Investment trusts uh, to each other, investment trusts and unit trusts uh, basically invest money in a, in a range of investments. And the great thing about investing in a range of investments for me and as an individual, let's say putting uh, uh, money in for savings really, and I don't want to put it in a bank, I want to put it into shares. Uh, it's 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 quite inefficient for me to go uh, buy you know a hundred shares in Marks and Spencers, a hundred shares in BP, a hundred shares in HSBC, a hundred shares in British Aerospace or something of that sort. They're very large transaction costs, and then I have to keep monitoring all these uh, shares to see do I want to keep all of these shares or do I want to sell some and buy others and so on. Essentially, investment trusts and unit trusts do that for me. Uh, investment trusts have a number of different funds. So some of the funds might uh, uh, be in predominantly European shares. Some of the funds might be in what's called emerging markets. Some of the funds might be specializing in, in American companies. And they nearly always have a range of investments there. So if we're saying, I would like to invest essentially in a European fund, I would go to an investment trust and that investment trust would have shares in Renault, it would have shares in Volkswagen, it would have shares in Fiat in, and, and, and so on, uh, shares maybe in Seat or something, uh, or, in, or Ferro uh, in, 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 in the, the, uh, the Zara holding company, which is Spanish and so on. It gives me access through one investment to a whole range of shares in Europe. And the fund managers will look after this and they will buy and sell shares, keeping it within the European stock markets, uh, and, and, and it takes a lot of the, the bother out of it for individual investors and makes it much more cost-effective. And unit trusts are very similar, technically slightly different, but essentially give the, uh, uh, the same end effect. Allows individual investors, small investors, to spread their money over many, many investments, which reduces risk. Pension funds. Uh, pension funds are going to be held for the long term, typically maybe 40 years. Uh, people start maybe putting into the pension at 25, retire at 65. You want to put your money somewhere safe where it's going to be looked after safely in the long term. Uh, and pension funds allow you and your employer to pay into a pension fund uh, where it's held, invested in various ways, uh, and you hope by the time you get to retirement age that the funds have grown into something which is going to give you a decent standard of living 40 years away. Venture capitalists. Uh, venture capitalists uh, essentially uh, are going to be, as, as a name would suggest here with venture, put your money into high risk, usually startup ventures. It's it's quite difficult, it will be quite difficult without venture capitalists for new businesses to get money to expand. 
new businesses can't really go to the stock exchange because they don't have a track record that you need for the stock exchange. But venture capitalists specialize in giving money to new businesses, high risk new businesses, to, to kind of get them started. They require quite a high rate of return, maybe typically 30%. And usually what they want is what's called an equity investment in the business. They want the chance of capital growth in the business. And then after maybe five years, something of that sort, the venture capitalists would like to get their money out of this new venture. And the way they would do that is maybe they would hope by the time five years has passed, uh, the uh, company could be listed on the stock exchange so that the shares can easily be sold. Or maybe what they look for is a, a large company to take over this business now that it's proved itself to be successful and the venture capitalist gets the money out like that. They require this high return of kind of 30% because they have quite a high rate of failure. They put their money into new companies, but of course there's a very high risk that new companies will not actually be successful. But you have to try them out because every large company started at one point as a new company, and venture capital is a very important element of dynamic economies. Financial instruments uh, Financial instruments are simply assets that can be traded and they allow the efficient flow of resources uh, between investors and people who, uh, who, who need investment, who need money. And essentially, they're contracts. Uh, they create a financial asset in one entity, uh, uh, that is the investor, and they create a financial liability in another entity, that is essentially the borrower. So, here's a list of the typical sort of financial instruments you have. Uh, we have equity shares, and I think we talked about equity shares a little bit when we talked about costs of capital, really. Equity shares, if you remember, they will get a dividend. That's an annual payout out of profits, if there are any profits. But remember, this dividend can go up or down. It's not set. It is at a discretion of the directors. And they hope also for a capital gain. They hope if the company goes well that the share value will go up and they get a vote. But if you remember it's relatively high risk. The dividends are not certain, the capital gain is not certain, and if the company goes into liquidation the equity shareholders are at the very last the very end of the queue when it comes to payouts. Preference shares are relatively unimportant as financial instruments, but on one side you put your money into the company uh, and you get a, a, a preference share out, if you like. Here the dividends are constant. However, there's likely to be no gain Uh, uh, no vote, but they're at slightly lower risk because the dividends are constant uh, and the preference shareholders has to be paid back before the equity. The benches and bonds, the benches and bonds are essentially just loans. Uh, you make a loan to the company, there you have an asset, you're owed money by that company, and the company has a liability, it owes you money. Uh, and what you get for these debentures and bonds here, of course, you're going to get interest. The value can go up and down a little bit. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, and quite often they're what's called secured. So interest has to be paid. The, 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 the bonds of the debentures are often secured and assets of the company. So if the company fails, uh, the lender can grab those assets and sell them and take what they're owed out of the proceeds. They're therefore relatively low risk, and if they're relatively low risk, uh, then they require a relatively low uh, return to the investors, say compared to equity, where the risk is much higher. And, as we mentioned, they also enjoy tax relief and the interest. So if there's tax relief at 30%, it's really reducing the net cost of the interest down to 70% of what it appears to be very important source of finance. 
However, uh, they, the value of goes up and down a little bit. Uh, it's not going to go up and down a lot. You're not going to get huge capital gains coming from the benches. Convertibles are really quite interesting. Convertibles start as debentures. And if you want, you have an option to change them to, to equity. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, think of uh, investing in a new company. So an equity investment in a new company is really quite risky. However, lending to the new company is going to be safer because you could be securing a loan and assets, you're going to get the interest and so on. But wouldn't you feel uh, a bit kind of disappointed if the company did really well? And here you are stuck with these rather dull debentures. So what a convertible allows you to do is a kind of wait and see approach. Lend to the company in the early days when it's really quite risky. Watch how it's doing. And if you see the company looks as though it's going to be a success, you can opt to change the debentures into shares uh, so you can then uh, open up access to potential capital gains which are going to flow out as the company continues to be successful. So if uh, the, the the rate that you're going to be uh, putting on your debenture was 6%, you'd say maybe the rate that's going to be paid on the debenture is 5% because it gives the investor, it gives them 5%, but also gives the investor uh, a way of opening the door to get higher capital gains, uh, which is not available to just a pure debenture holder. Loans and overdrafts, uh, loans uh, very often something like five years, ten year loans, something of that sort. Overdrafts, uh, a bit more dangerous for the borrower because these are repayable on demand. And really, you shouldn't be looking for long-term finance through overdrafts. It's, it's a precarious uh, way of raising capital. If the bank could say, I want it back tomorrow. Uh, overdrafts are particularly useful uh, for short-term cash flow difficulties. Uh, so take, uh, um, say, uh, a company in the West. Uh, and of course, in, in the West, uh, they, one of the big shopping times is kind of November, December, leading up to, to Christmas and so on, many gift support. Uh, and what shops have to do is they have to buy a lot of inventory in kind of October, November, so they have it in stock for sales in December. Uh, so they have a, a kind of cash embarrassment. They have to pay for these purchases, and they're not going to really get the money until December. And this is perfect for an overdraft. You get this temporary loan in October to buy goods, and then when they're sold in December, you can use those proceeds to pay back the overdrafts. So as kind of seasonal uh, uh, use of overdrafts is particularly particularly good. Lease contracts, uh, where you lease an asset rather than buying it, typically something like five years. Common in machinery, common in vehicles, uh, common in computers, common in printing presses and so on there. Rather than having to to borrow a lot of money and then pay that for the asset, you can do a lease contract and basically you pay an amount every month uh, which allows you to use that asset. Certificates of deposit is where you have got surplus cash. We're not borrowing it out. We want to simply deposit it. And a certificate of deposit is basically put money with the bank. You get this certificate which is saying this person has, has put up you know, 100,000 in the bank for three months at a rate of interest of 5% per annum, something of that sort. Government bonds, uh, another place that you can invest money. We know that the government sometimes needs to borrow money uh, to pay for uh, its, its projects, to pay for social security and so on. The government issues bonds. You can buy bonds on the stock exchange and so on. It's a way of basically putting money on deposit. Uh, but here, the person paying you the interest is going to be the government. And to all intents and purposes, government bonds are regarded as being risk-free. The value can come down a little bit, as we may see, uh, but you're going to get your interest. And then finally, a bill of exchange. A bill of exchange, if you ever come across a cheque, 
Uh, a bill of exchange is a bit like a cheque. It's used, or was used, certainly in imports and exports. Uh, what I can do is I can write a bill of exchange. Uh, basically, it's an order to my bank to pay my supplier a certain amount, maybe in three months' time. Uh, so it's used, as I say, particularly, or was used. I think its uh, use is falling down a little bit now because of internet transfers and so on. Uh, but it's a way of transferring money between buyers and sellers. Now let's see uh, how the price of bonds, or whether it's government bonds, or whether it's individual bonds, uh, is, is going to perhaps vary. So here we have uh, a picture of a bond, and it says it's a 5% treasury bond. It says it's going to be redeemed in 2050, that's when it's going to be repaid. And it says the nominal value is 100. This means if I own this bit of paper, and you would own a bit of paper, you are going to earn uh, $5 per annum. Because it's 5% on the nominal or par value is what you're going to get if you earn, if you own this bit of paper. This $5 will come to you every year. Now what happens if the prevailing rate of interest is only 2.5%. So there's a very poor rate of interest. If I went to the bank uh, and put money in the bank, the bank would only pay me 2.5%. Now this means that, that this, this bond is actually quite a desirable object because it seems to be paying 5%, or at least it's paying 5% on the nominal value. Now, if I wanted to buy one of these bonds, no one in their right mind would sell it to me for a hundred. Because if they sold it to me for a hundred, I'd be earning five percent, double what the going rate is. So what they're going to be thinking about, well, maybe what happens if the market value here is two hundred. So, so the par value, the nominal value will never change. It's printed on this bond in indelible ink. The 5% is printed on the bond in indelible ink. That is never going to change. If you own this bit of paper, you will get $5 a year. But if I want to acquire this bit of paper, a fair price would be 200 Because if I pay 200 and I'm getting 5 per annum, then of course that's coming to 2.5% as my effective return. So the interest, interest rates fall in the economy, the value of these bonds will rise. Similarly, of course, if the prevailing interest rate was 10%, uh, a very high rate of interest available in the bank, I would be stupid to pay $100 for this bond. Because if I paid $100, I would be earning $5 per annum, I would just be earning 5%. When, when I could go to the bank, uh, and I could earn 10%. So what's going to happen is this is now a, a, not a desirable piece of paper. It's not paying me enough money, really, uh, to keep up with the, the going rate of 10%. But what happens if the, the market value of this fell now to 50? So now I can buy one of these for 50. Because I own this bit of paper, I'm going to get this 5 per annum. And of course, this is the equal to 10%. Uh, so as the rate of interest rises, the value of these bonds falls. And that's always the case. Interest up, bond down. Interest down, value of the bond goes up. And it's quite important to understand that relationship. Function of a central bank, central bank like a Bank of England, or in America it's the Federal Reserve. Uh, just a list of functions here. There's a government's banker. This is uh, the bank to whom you pay uh, uh, your tax and so on. Out there. It is a bank which uh, will, will pay people their social security benefits and, and pensions and so on, government pensions and so on. It manages a national debt. It helps the government to, uh, to deal with its borrowings and so on there. Uh, it, it is a central note issuing authority. This is basically who prints the money. Uh, and, and looks after the money supply. It manages foreign exchange. Uh, uh, when uh, the 
somebody wants to export uh, and they're getting a lot of dollars coming in, uh, who's actually going to be, you know, responsible for taking those dollars and giving you your own currency back? And that will be ultimately the central bank. They said interest rates. Uh, the Bank of England has got its monetary policy committee that meets every month and decides whether the interest rate should go up or down. It will be looking at inflation. If inflation is going up, it will tend to put the interest rate up so that people are willing to borrow less and spend less. And, and this is going to put a little bit of a dampener on the economy. It will control credit. It will tell banks how much of each deposit they're allowed to lend on, and this controls credit, as we'll see very quickly. There is a regulatory process. This changes from time to time, exactly who does it. Sometimes it's a central bank, sometimes it's uh, somebody else. Uh, at the minute, uh, in the UK, since 2014, it's the Financial Conduct Authority performs the regulatory uh, tasks. It's a lender to the banking system. Remember I talked, what happens if everybody wants their money out of the bank at the same time, the bank doesn't have it, uh, then they can go to the uh, central bank and say, look, we're having a bit of a problem. Can you lend me the money so that I can pay this on to my depositors? And in controlling inflation uh, here, this is very much done by banks through controlling interest rates and uh, controlling credit. It is the remit of the Bank of England uh, to keep inflation rates at a particular uh, rate. I think it's around 2.5% that they're supposed to be trying to aim for uh, for a, a, a reasonable rate of inflation. What interests, uh, what, uh, what influences interest rates? And uh, the, the way interest rates move uh, uh, according to the length of the deposit is called the yield curve. So here what we have is uh, you, you can go to a banker building society and you can say to these people, I want to put money on deposit for three months, a relatively short time. You'll be down here. This is what's meant by this time to maturity. So this might be three months. Or you can say, uh, maybe I want to put it on for four months. I won't be doing this to scale here, uh, a big part of a year, so 12 months here. Or maybe you say, I want to put it on to uh, for three years. I say, it's not to scale. Uh, and what you would generally expect is for the interest rate, this return or yield is essentially the interest rate you'd be quoted. Uh, in Normally, it's going to be increasing. Uh, because if you say, I want to tie up my money for three months. There's relatively little risk there. But if you say, I'm going to tie up my money for three years, you can't get at it. You want a bit more. And of course, the, the borrower should be willing to pay you a bit more because they know they you can't come to them and demand it back for three years. It allows them to plan. It is more useful in many ways to them to have this certainty for three years than to be kind of worrying, oh, you know, where am I going to get the money from to repay this person when they come in three months to get their money back? So the, the normal yield curve is going to be increasing. You can occasionally have a reverse yield curve where it's going to be going down. Okay, so if this is your three months and this is your 12 months out here. And the interest rate you'd be charged for 12 months uh, or the interest rate you would earn rather for 12 months is rather less than what you would earn for the, the 12 months. Now what is going to cause this uh, reverse yield curve, this, this uh, change of shape so that longer deposits uh, will actually earn you less interest? And the assumption really is that the market thinks interest rates are going to fall. So if they think interest rates are going to fall, the markets would be silly to kind of promise you this very kind of high interest rate we have here. The market says, gosh, interest rates are going to fall. I don't want to be locked into paying a really high interest rate uh, when for maybe most of the period here, the interest rates are actually going to be 
smaller. So they're kind of anticipating a fall in interest rates. Uh, and that's why the, the longer period to maturity is going to attract less interest. And finally, uh, we have uh, a slide showing the way banks can create money. Uh, it, the, the process is rather like the multiplier that we saw in, in an earlier lecture. Uh, and, and what it is, is, is how banks, by taking deposits from their customers and lending those on, and then getting more deposits in from that, and so on, so the money goes round and round and round, uh, and one deposit can be used to create quite a lot of credit. So here we have uh, the customer who deposits a thousand. Now the Bank of England uh, is uh, going to be setting what's called a reserve ratio. This says, this R percent here, this is telling the banks you have to keep back, you mustn't lend on, you must keep in your bank vault, really, a certain percentage of this money. Uh, and that, that keeps the bank safe in, in case people come and say, I want my money back. If you were to lend out all of the money paid in and then people want their money back, you could be seriously embarrassed. So the higher the reserve ratio, the in many ways the safer, the more conservative the banking system is. This is one of the things that altered after the financial crash. The reserve ratios tended to go up. So the bank will keep 250, uh, and the bank can lend to another customer 750. Of course, that customer who's borrowed that money, uh, they could pay that to, let's say, an employee. So the employee receives 750, and they pay the 750 into their bank account. And the bank keeps 25%. All of this here is the 25% of what was deposited. Okay, uh, And so the bank gets in 750, keeps 25%, can lend out 56250 to a customer. Uh, and this customer it maybe uses this uh, to, again, pay one of their employees or to, to buy goods or something. But this 56250, it gets into the economy. People are spending this money now. Uh, and, and, it, and it comes in again here, this uh, and so on. This 562, you keep back a quarter, you lend on three quarters and so on. So basically what's happening here, the, 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 this goes on and on and on here. Uh, and the uh, 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 credit created here is given by this formula. It is the original deposit. If you add up what the, what the bank can kind of land on here and actually kind of create more money, uh, the, the, the amount of credit which is created is one or the initial deposit divided by the reserve ratio. So essentially for putting on 1,000 with a reserve ratio of 25%, uh, you're creating credit of 4,000. You're creating money of 4,000. If the reserve ratio was more conservative, it was say 50%, then of course the banks would only be creating money of 2,000. If the reserve ratio was at 10%, 0 0.1 in here, uh, then of course one person putting a thousand in the bank uh, would essentially allow the bank by continually lending and bringing in deposits and things again, lending going round and round and round, essentially the bank would be then creating money of 10,000, a great stimulus really to the economy.